formerly Prussia, and is a member of the Ukrainian National Women's League of America. She has been a journalist for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, worked for the Atlantic Council Think Tank, and has been a Fulbright Scholar in Ukraine. During her Fulbright tenure, Irena recorded video interviews with former Ukrainian political prisoners and training students in radio journalism. She is currently an editor with Stop Fake, a fact-checking website that debunks Russian disinformation and propaganda. Our second witness is Tatiana Rapoport, a translator and an interpreter from Russian into French who immigrated from Kyiv, Ukraine to New York City in 1989. Since the early 90s, she's worked in refugee resettlement agencies such as the New York Association for New Americans, and now HIAS, where she serves as Assistant Director of Budget and Fiscal Compliance. HIAS has its own campaign to protect Ukrainian refugees, and we're putting that link in the chat as well. Tatiana is married to journalist Walter Ruby, who we'll learn more about at the end of our readings, as he offers personal reflection to kick off a short community discussion with all of you at which point we'll ask that you turn on your video cameras, which are off now, so that we can partake in a 15 minute conversation. But now as a way of entering into these plays, let's hear first from Blair Rubel, distinguished fellow at the Wilson Center in DC, and before that, director of its Kennan Institute. Blair is the author of seven book length works, including Muse of Urban Delirium, which is now available in Ukrainian translation. He's also received an honorary doctorate from the Ukrainian Modern Art Research Institute. Blair, welcome. Thank you, Ari, and thank you, Dorit and Lorraine. Um, I'm really honored to participate in this evening's program. It, it's a very special and important one. When the Russians crossed Ukraine's borders on February 24th, some of the world's leading theater artists rallied to launch an international initiative to bear witness to Putin's horrors. Maxime Korochkin of Kiev's Theater of Playwrights, Philip Arnaud of Baltimore's Center for International Theater Development, Noah Berkstein Bren of London's Sputnik Theater, John Friedman and others, began to commission Ukraine's playwrights to create scripts in response to the war. Their early effort has grown into the worldwide Ukrainian play readings project. By the end of April, the project had commissioned more than 100 new scripts and made them available online. These plays have been translated into English and other languages. Well over 100 project sponsored readings, such as the one this evening, have taken place in some 20 countries. Proceeds like this evening are used to support Ukraine-based organizations. Maxim Korochkin personifies the transfer of creative energy to Ukraine that's been happening for some time. A Russian-speaking native of Kiev, he became one of the new Russia drama movement's brightest stars. He worked in Moscow in the post-Soviet theatrical hotbed of Yekaterinburg as well as in the Russian film industry. More than a half dozen years ago, Korochkin returned to his hometown where he joined with two dozen playwrights to establish the theater of playwrights to nurture a rising generation of Ukrainian theater artists. More recently, he switched to writing his own works, some of which are included in, in the larger project. Uh, he began writing in Ukrainian. The artistry on display this evening is a response to the horrors the Russians have inflicted on Ukraine. This originality, it's important to know, builds on the creation of a vibrant Ukrainian theater community over the past several decades, as talented Ukrainian theater artists, indeed gifted artists in several artistic genres, have wrestled with the meaning of post-independence Ukraine. The playwrights involved in this project, like those who, whose work we're going to be hearing from this evening, 
have been engaged in creating a new Ukrainian theater for years. That preparation provided the launching pad for the works being produced in response to this horrible war. Ukrainians have awed the world with their passion, resilience, creativity, and commitment to build a better country. Their land and culture profoundly matter to them. Ukraine no longer stands in anyone's shadow. As the arts are revealing, Ukrainians themselves have built and continue to build a distinctive culture and society. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll ask our friends to turn off their video cameras so that we can just spotlight the actors. Thank you. <laughs> A Dictionary of Emotions in Wartime by Elena Atasieva. Panic. I fly into my apartment and shout, Mat Matvey, quick, run to the store. We need to buy food. Auntie, we have tons of food. I bought potatoes. There's more than enough for two days. Don't you get it? War has begun. What if the stores close for a week or a month? We can't imagine that. Nothing has ever happened in his 21 years that would have stopped him going to a store at any time he wanted to buy whatever he wanted. Fear. We are being bumped. I hear the sound of shells outside the window. I Google what to do. Hide in your apartment between two windowless walls, no doors, no windows. Run around the apartment. I don't have any walls without windows or doors. Even the bathroom has a window. The corridor sir, has three doors and one of those has glass in it. Oh, what idiotic planning. Maybe best run to the basement? I go to Google again. Do not hide in basements under any circumstance if there is no water source, air conditioning, and a toilet. We have none of that in our basement. I lie down on the sofa. Nothing is going to help me anyway. Hunger. You have to stand in line for three hours to buy anything. But what do you buy? buy meat and freeze it? But if a shell strikes the electric grid, there will be no electricity and the meat will go bad. Macaroni and grains? But what are you going to eat if they turn off the gas? Oh, you need something that doesn't have to be prepared. Cook? They sold out long ago. There are none on the store shelves. Try out some bread maybe, but there's no bread either. I look at the empty shelves in confusion. Come home with something, something we can eat in a basement while bombs land on my apartment building. Cleaning. I hate the dust. I really vacuum the place. But what if the apartment is bumped? Then why the wasted the effort? What if they evacuate us and we have to leave immediately? No point mopping the floors. Does one need to clean an apartment in wartime? Does anyone know what the rules are on this? The trail. I didn't understand immediately what was going on. Why were my cultured friends from Russia mumbling their abstract phrases such as I oppose war instead of saying my government is committing a crime. It has been seized by evil forces. I am in despair and don't know what to do. Just three people wrote that to me. 
probably quite a few, given that it seems every fourth inhabitant of Russia is not only not against the war with Ukraine, but even happy with it. it treated citizens of the Russian Federation like living people. They turned out to be zombies. Most annoying is that my friends who quit communicating with Russians and switched over to the Ukrainian language after 2014 turned out to be right. What tolerant. I thought people were not to blame. It's all Putin. I didn't watch Russian TV. I didn't know what was going, what was happening there. Exchanges with a Russian girlfriend. How are you, Lena? Life. The city is occupied. There is no way out. You asked me to write, who among us Russians support you? I don't understand. How could anyone not support you? I do believe that not everyone in the Russian Federation is a zombie. I have a couple friends in the Ukraine. Some have been very aggressive. Some have quit writing altogether. My friend in Kiev saw some rocket out her window and she unleashed an incredible tirade of aggressive accusations at me in a DM as if I were personally to blame for that. I understand her. When your home is being bombed, you feel hatred. I myself would like to understand. There are many dead and wounded. Parkif is destroyed. Kiev is constantly being bombed. Many of my friends are refugees now. I couldn't imagine something like this happening in the 21st century. I am afraid to go out of the house. Lies for bread are two hours long. The sanctions against our country are laughable. Half of Russia consists of backwater towns, as I imagine it, grannies and chicken coops, so what's not working out there? Apple pay? I'm gonna go feed the chickens. It's like finding myself in a movie about war. It's a nightmare. You go to bed and you fear your home will be bumped that night. There is nowhere to buy food or medicine. And when you write about all this, your Russian friends answer that it's fake news. What do you think? How do I feel? This situation is complicated by the fact that I've had COVID for two weeks. I am constantly on different pills, wiped out entirely, and that makes it seem as though everything is a dream and I'll wake up any minute now. Such insane things can't possibly happen, except in dreams. I wish I could wake up too. A blockade is coming upon us too. I mean, it's informational for now, but an iron curtain is not far in the future. But I want to know the truth. I want to see it with open eyes, even if it frightens me. That's why I wrote to you directly. Did you see the video of Kiev and Kharkiv being bumped? That's all true. You need not doubt that. I'm afraid to watch Ukrainian channels. I, I can't stand so much pain and, and tears. Do you think... We can stand it. You, my husband received an official summons. He was very surprised. It said something like, just in case you must be blah, blah, blah. He's like that, okay, he's strange. Your friends and relatives will kill our people and vice versa. Then you will start to feel hatred. Don't worry. My husband couldn't kill a cockroach. If Putin orders him to, he will. Hatred. When you hear the sound of a shell flying at your house, well, at first you feel fear, then hate. hatred for whoever did it, for all of Russia, for all its inhabitants without exception. When there's silence outside the window, your brain kicks in. And only then can you rationally think about things. Until you hear the sound of a shell outside your window, you will not understand what hatred is.
love. I have a friend. Well, not so much a friend. The relationship is complicated. He lives near Kiev. I live in her song. We rarely see each other. He used to text me every morning. How are you, kid? As bad ass as ever? Now I write him every morning. How are you today? And everything? Are you still alive? We have decided that each of us was on our own. No obligations, an open relationship. Now we discuss how we will live together when the war is over. You will work and I will stay home and cook, he joked. The hell I say. I lie on the couch and read all day. And every evening I'll retell the stories of books to you. He wanted to come to her son on Women's Day, March 8. But the war began February 24. And now, I have no idea whether we'll get together or not. I am afraid one day he won't pick up the phone. The place where he is now is under heavy fire. Exchanges with a Ukrainian girlfriend. A woman was killed in the next house. I have no windows anymore. We're escaping now. Maybe someone will help us get out too. But where? I had no plans to leave until an hour ago. Now everything has changed. I took almost nothing. The cat is howling. Lena, pack your suitcase. Don't repeat my mistakes. What city are you in now? Rubezne, 15 kilometers from Severodonetsk. Severodonetsk is being shelled heavily. My job is gone. Shells keep hitting our neighborhood. I've already written off our apartment building. How are you doing? We are under occupation. No food or medicine have arrived in the city since the war began. We are threatened with starvation if this continues. For now, we are finishing up what we bought before the war. The city authority has not changed yet. The Ukrainian flag is still flying, but the mayor was ordered to forbid the residents to do several things. Drive a car, go out after 8 p.m., leave the city. Here they have begun killing the leaders of the territorial defense. I have no job anymore. Shells keep hitting my block. I already said goodbye to our building. I want to leave. I don't know what to do with the cat. Basically, I'm totally confused. And it's not so easy to leave because of the shelling. But I'm scared as fuck. After a shell fell 20 meters from my house, I am still shaking. An entire family here was shot in their car on their way out of city. I want to escape, but my brain is overloaded. Home, mom, the cat, to say nothing about the fact that my boyfriend will be mobilized. That's obvious. He will stay here. He plans to join the territorial defense. Unfortunately, we aren't married. We put it off all summer. First, we remodeled our apartment. Then we traveled. Then we were swamped with work. I didn't really want to get married officially. I thought, who needs it? But now... How will I look for him later if I am not his wife? I only hope he survives. And what's the point of me staying here if all the men are being conscripted? Our apartment is unlikely to survive. But what about our cat? Lena, I can't just leave him on the street. Irritation. I read the posts of those who managed to escape. They are in Europe now, safe, and I am very happy for them. I follow their stories, some in Poland, some in Moldova, and some in Sweden. I understand it's difficult for them abroad. But 
irritates me for some reason. It's the desperation of being trapped. Guilt. I feel guilty when I read about Kharkiv and Mariupol because these cities are being bombed heavily. Our Kherson didn't suffer much. A shopping center, two apartment buildings, a few schools. We are kind of out of things because everyone else is fighting while we are under occupation. This is the guilt of the soldier who has been taken prisoner. Messages from friends. Message one. I've had no contact with mother since the morning of March 2nd. She's in Mariupol. All communications are cut. It's war. All I could find out as of today, no one has had gas, electricity, or communications and food for a long time. Her apartment house was bombed. People cook porridge on a bonfire in the courtyard. I hope she's alive. I believe she's fine. I'm waiting. Waiting is very hard. I'm powerless, but I believe. Message two. Today I crawled from the hunt with three loaves of bread and two packages of oatmeal. My sister, dad, and aunt conducted a social operation on apples, a special operation on apples and brought home a pack. There are no fruits and I need vitamins. I stood in line as explosions went on around us. Fuck it. A kilometer from my house, they're digging some kind of ditch. At the airport, four kilometers away, we hear explosions at night. I spend all day on the internet, probably like everyone else. I'll give birth soon. The main thing is to have access to the maternity ward and medicines. People write every day from different cities and countries. Come here, oh, oh more noble madmen. We are under occupation, where am I going to go? I keep kicking myself for not leaving, not for my sake, but for my future baby. I'm very pessimistic about the end of all this shit. That's life, one day at a time. Message three. Day 12 of the war, how are you doing? Everything is fine here, planes flying over, explosions. My legs are killing me from standing in line for food and animal feed. We have enough to eat for another five days. Then for a couple more days, we will eat pickled cucumbers and drink fruit compote. I'm exhausted. I try to read, but I really can't, especially when explosions keep distracting me from my book. I'm counting on the army. I donated all my free money to them in order to hasten our victory. Choices. What you can die of during a war? If a shell hits you, it rips you to pieces. If a shell hits your apartment building, you can crash under the rubble. When a shell hits, a building might catch fire. You might burn up or die of asphyxiation. You might be shot in your car as you try to leave town. You might die of hunger sitting in a shelter because you can't go out for provisions. You might die of hunger because there is a blockade and no food is delivered to your town. You might die of thirst if your water system is damaged and there's no water. You might die of illness because medicines are not being delivered to your city. Time. As soon as war began, we said, it will last a few days and then it will be over. Then it will, it will all be finished in three to four days. Then we'll know what to expect in two weeks. Two weeks passed and now I hear this war was planned to last a month. For some reason, I have bad premonitions. Weather. As I awoke this morning, I heard a thunder. I thought it was going to rain. Then I came to fully and realized those were shells exploding. 
person, March 12, 2022. And now our first testimony from Irena Chalupa. Muted. We need to, you need to unmute, Irena. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, forgive me. I'm here with you tonight because Ukraine is my country. It is the place where my ancestors come from. It's a place that I was raised on and it's a place I love. It's a country of wonderful beauty and endless possibility. And today we are seeing those possibilities being brutally destroyed by Russia. Today is the 71st day of the war. I wanna give testimony to some of the people who have died as a result of this horrible war. Today, today, 15 year old Denis Selevina, the son of a Kharkiv zoo caretaker and a volunteer was killed in a barrage of Russian shelling at the zoo. He was helping to evacuate animals from the facility, which Russian troops have nearly destroyed. At least five zoo employees have already died during the invasion and a hundred animals. Sasha, a 10 year old boy hiding in a basement in the besieged and decimated port city of Mariupol doesn't know that his mother was torn to pieces by Russian artillery more than a week ago. No one can bring themselves to tell the boy his mother is dead. They've told him she was wounded and taken to hospital. Every day Sasha asks to be taken to the hospital to see his mother and no one has the courage to tell him the truth. Breaking out of Irpin, that's a town uh, near Ukraine's capital, a mother tied her hand to her small sons with a string so that they wouldn't lose each other in the crowd. She told him that if something happens to her, he should run to women with children and ask for help. 91-year-old Holocaust survivor Vanda Obietkova died on April 4th while sheltering from Russian strikes during the siege of Mariupol. She died in a freezing basement without water, cold, hungry, and scared in a grim echo of how she hid in the basement from the Nazis when she was 10 years old. Vanda was the second Holocaust survivor known to have died because of Russia's barbaric war in Ukraine. A mother wrote the name, date of birth, and family telephone number on her five-year-old daughter's back in ink in case the child, Victoria, was separated from her mom during the evacuation of their town. Natalia Luhoska, a psychologist from the Azov Regiment died in Mariupol yesterday. She died in that besieged Azov style plant. Her son, whose code name was Barrett, was killed in the war in Donbass in 2018. His mother wanted to continue her son's struggle and stayed with the Ukrainian military until the end. On April 24th, Yuri Glodan stepped out of his Odessa apartment to go to the shops for some baby, baby supplies. He was a proud father. His wife had recently given birth and they had an adorable baby named Kira who seems to have been born with a smile on her face. When he returned, his wife Valeria, his mother-in-law and little Kira were dead. A Russian missile had ripped through their apartment building. Three generations of one family were gone in the blink of an eye. How did she threaten Russia? It seems that killing children is just a new national idea of the Russian Federation, an outraged Ukrainian President Zelensky asked in his nightly address. But there's also hope. Fedir Shandor, a philosophy professor at Uzhorod National University, that's a city in Western Ukraine, close to the border with Slovakia and Hungary, he lectures to his stu students via Zoom from the trenches in Eastern Ukraine. Life must continue. This is not some abstract faraway conflict that has nothing to do with us. These are real people with dreams and hopes, with families and friends, with hobbies and pets, with longings and joys, people with names and faces, just like us. Let's honor them, give them voice and help them prevail. Thank you.
Our Children by Natasha Block. My family today is in Occupy Kherson. My dad, my uncle, my sister, and my three children. Matve is the eldest. The youngest are Herman and Tihan. Kherson was occupied by Russian fascists on the first day of the war. Battles came to us from the direction of Crimea. Battles came to us from Nikolaev. Tanks crossed the Pontanevsky Bridge. The first rockets and bombs hit the suburbs of Kherson. The Russian fascists took Oleshki, Kahovka, and the village of Tianginka, where my youngest Tihon was born. And they seized the city of Kherson. Two weeks before that, my ex-husband had written to me. He asked for permission to take our children abroad. Like all of us, he feared Russia's military buildup on the Ukrainian border. We talked about that, and I found out that permission was not necessary. His plan was to go to Poland, then the Czech Republic by car. Aside from my youngest boys, he would go with his wife and their five-year-old son, Lucas. I called Herman, who had just turned 13 in January, a month before bombs began falling all over Ukraine. I asked if they had left yet. Herman said that Lucas woke him at 5 a.m. and told him to pack his things. They were getting ready to go. They spent a lot of time and energy getting ready. In short, I don't know what went wrong, and I'm not going to ask, but the boy's father decided it was too dangerous to go, so they stayed home. That was a very bad decision, a very, very bad decision. All these days I keep wondering why he made that decision. Because on that first day, it was still possible to leave by car. My friend Marina got her son out to Uzgurit. She had a car, trains that day were not coming to Kherson. My eldest, Matvey, who lives with his aunt, my sister, was also in Kherson. That day, he called several times and gave me some good advice. Mom, grab all your valuables, documents, and money in a sack and carry it with you at all times. If you go out without a backpack, when they bomb the house, you'll have no documents. He wasn't planning on leaving because he was liable to be mobilized because of his age. He was very happy. He said the explosions were far away from him. He didn't hear any sirens in his area. The basement in their building had been fixed up. He had already sealed up the windows. Okay, I'm very happy that his character is so easygoing and that he has matured so that he can give me such excellent advice. I know that his friends from Donbass were probably the ones who advised him. It's a hellish, horrible thing to think about advice like that. Why should our children have knowledge like this? Sirens howled all the time in Kiev, where I was at that time. The basement was horrible and they were killing people everywhere they could. I stood in line for medicine and called my friend Dima. Dima was in a positive mood too. He said he'd been waiting for the war for a long time and that Ukraine would win and that Russia had signed its own death warrant and would fall apart in a few years and he had food for the next two months and he would share with Matvey. That made me feel better. Not for long though. Maybe it was that very day when I acquired the habit of checking to see if Matvey was online or if my younger sons were online. Matvey wrote that his aunt was very worried, but he was not. He heard several explosions and the house shook. He wrote that the basement was a good place to be, although it's bad that there's only one exit. Still, he thinks they'll dig him out if something happens. He wrote this as if it wasn't the first war in his life, but the 31st. I constantly watched the news and saw that tanks were headed for Kherson. I called my youngest son, my 10 year old, T. Hun. He calmly said that he could hear explosions. I asked if he was scared. He said, why should I be scared? How good it is that he doesn't know that one should fear explosions. How I would love it if he never had to learn that. That evening, they wrote on the internet that the Russians were trying to seize Chernobyl, the atomic station. I wrote about that to Matvey. My son said there was no radiation there and that he was going to bed. I thought, it's so good. He is so positive and carefree and that he can sleep. 
but it's not all that simple. The next night, Matt Vey wrote me that the news was saying Kiev would be bombed at 3 a.m. and that I should go down to the basement and that he had heard lots of explosions, but they were far away, so he wasn't going to go to the basement. I did, though, because the siren howled and the explosions were nearby. The next day, after a sleepless night in the basement, I telephoned my children but couldn't get through. Not to any of them. I called their father, he didn't answer either. I began to worry and I decided to wait out the next siren in the bathroom. Just as I called my children, my mother called from abroad. I got the impression she was more worried than I was. I called my children again. I wrote to them on Messenger. In fact, Tihan is on Viber, Matve is on Telegram, and Herman uses Discord. Three sons, three different worlds. I wrote them, but uh, they didn't answer. All messengers were silent. Finally, I reached their father. He was calm and said they had a good basement in their building. All was good. He would put the kids in the car and get them out of town at the first opportunity. That calmed me down some. No one knew at the time that no such opportunity would arise and that there would only be death and rockets. Madvey wrote that he decided to stock up on cigarettes. My sister did the same with food. <laughs> they would wait out the end of the war and he had already seen two people with machine guns. The next day I left Kiev and sat in a traffic jam without internet for 12 hours. When I finally got internet, I saw Matt Ray had written to say he was worried and that our Ukrainian heroes were dying here and now and that he believed our army would defeat the orcs. Tihan and Herman slept that night in the bomb shelter. I didn't sleep at all that night because I was in my car on the road. Tihan said after that night he was feeling good and that in general, he was quite happy now. I asked, what are you so happy about? He said, because I'm still alive. He said that in a weak voice, a voice I would never want to hear my son speak in. My 13 year old Herman was very depressed. He said Putin would win because there are 140 million of them and 30 million of us. He always loved math and he studied in a special math class that he had really wanted to join. Mathematics is a fine science, but we are defending our land. I wanted to believe Matve. He told me the news. The Russians were planning on deporting Ukrainians from Kherson. They would throw them in police vans and take them somewhere. They had found a thousand Ukrainian military uniforms and they would change into them and would lead people out of the, out of the city disguised as Ukrainians. Then Matvey added optimistically that that's all not so important. The main thing now was not to open the doors for the Russians. I called Matvey again when I was in a day long line on the border. There was no internet, but my phone worked. Matvey said that the Russians had bombed the only entertainment center in town, the water canal, killed 30 young men from the territorial defense, and that his friend sent a video showing the bodies of Kersonians blown to pieces. The youngest boys disappeared again. I had no communication with them. I was very worried. I imagined the horrible picture of a bomb landing on their building. Basically, my body was who knows where, but in my thoughts, I was always in Kherson. I read all the news about Kherson. Some was fake, some was real. The worst news was not about shelling, but about the fact that food had disappeared from the stores, medicines from pharmacies, and that the women of Kherson were giving birth in basements. Basically, there was a very optimistic video from a chief doctor of a maternity ward. He taped it in the basement of a maternity ward and there were lots of women around him. He said almost everyone had given birth, just a few were left. The women tried to smile. Meanwhile, the Russian occupants wandered around the city, shooting up whatever they wanted, robbing stores and killing people. The telephone and internet in Kherson was constantly cutting out. But I read that and tried not to worry. My friend from Kherson 
wrote that the Russians had killed the son of his teacher in Kherson. All the news of that kind, all such reports made, made me look at my phone and click all the messengers of my three sons in order. Viber, Tihan. Tihan was last seen online four hours ago. Okay, he'd been in contact. Discord, Herman changed his status. I make avatars on commission. Russia is bombing my place of residence. So I often sit in a bomb shelter with no internet. Matt Bay, Telegram, last seen online yesterday. Yesterday was a nervous day. I called my sister to hear her say that everyone was okay, that everyone was alive and that there was plenty of food. I reached a temporary shelter for Ukrainians. There were mothers with their children. The children asked questions like, why is Putin bombing us? That's not fair, mom. His country is bigger. What does he want from us? Why are they killing us? Is the sky closed over us here in Poland? Why don't they close the sky over Ukraine? What is that sound? Children showed me pictures of them sitting in basements and they told me how important it was to hide when the sirens blow. They told me about the dog they left with a neighbor because they couldn't take it with them. Children and adults all shuddered whenever there were loud sounds. Mothers of the children told how their men to the very last were defending Ukraine with arms in hand. A few days later, Herman made me a new avatar on the background of Ukrainian flag. And he said he was going to organize a quest. Matt Vey photoshopped some memes about hate Russia. Tihan simply said that everything was okay and that he loved me. The invaders in Kherson seize the local jail. I think it's so it will remind them of the prison they live in at home. People in Kherson were going out to protest. I posted a photo on Facebook of one such rally. It showed a girl holding a poster with the words, Putin has a small dick. <laughs> the Russian Nazis shot up a car filled with children near Kohovka. There was no green corridor. All my children remained in Kherson. The shops were closed or empty, although sometimes you could buy food. My children assured me they had plenty of food and I cooked soup, thinking that maybe they have nothing to eat and that hunger was coming. My stomach clenched and my hands began to shake. Ukraine sent 16 vehicles with humanitarian aid to Kherson. The occupiers would not let them into the city. They set up their own food centers in Kherson's main square. And do you know what the people did? They just didn't come. They would not come for that Ruski food. Instead, they went out to protest again. I saw a video where shots were fired and city residents shouted shame at them. One guy with a big flag of Ukraine climbed on a Ruski tank and waved his flag and the tank drove away. That calmed me a bit. I thought maybe people weren't so hungry there, but this animal maternal fear and my desire to feed my children almost made it impossible for me to breathe. Yesterday, Matt Bay told me how to write about where he is now. He has started working on a different project. This morning, I talked to Herman. He said, Kherson is quiet. The bombs here are coming from Mykolaiv and that if they were to leave, they would go to Spain because some relatives of their father had found an apartment there. I thought, let them go wherever they want as long as there is no war there. But it still wasn't possible to leave. Herman joked that, that grandma was going to inflate a rubber boat and they would sail it down the Dnieper River to the Canary Islands that night. Such a sad little joke. Herman also said he loves me very much. And I love him very much. And Tihan and Herman and my sister and Kherson and all Ukrainians, for many days now, I've wanted to hear that my children are safe. I probably never wanted anything so much in my life. My head is full of chaos, fuck knows what, and my care song. 
and all of our children. Our second testimony is from Tatiana Rappaport. Hi, everyone. I um, am so emotional after listening to these readings. I have friends in Kherson, and I'm worrying about them. But I'm here tonight to talk about my sister to provide a testimony about her journey to um, relative safety. She lived in Kiev until recently, until February 22nd. Um, and we pushed her out just in time before the invasion. I say pushed her out because she was holding on. She didn't want to leave. She wanted to stay. She said, I want to be in Ukraine. But we were saying to her, you have your child, so you have to take care of him. If it's not for you, then for your son. So my sister has two sons. The youngest, the one that she was able to escape with was 12 years old at that time. So she, uh, he turned 13 when they arrived in Ireland. So within a month, they first went to Chernovtsi and uh, after staying there for a short time and spending several nights in the bomb shelter, uh, it was clear for us that they should go on and we again pushed them out. They crossed the border to Romania and were um, spending some time with the Romanian family who was very kind to them, giving them food, um, trying to entertain them a little bit, showing their town. Uh, the communication thankfully was possible because uh, the father of the family spoke some Ukrainian. Otherwise, it's just body language, smiles. Mila was uh, very taken by the kindness of the people. When they left, she gave them a present. Uh, she does needlework, so she did a beautiful runner. Um, just a thank you, a small appreciation. Then they uh, went on the plane and uh, came to Ireland. Uh, Nila's son, Bogdan, speaks beautiful English and his father who stayed in Kiev, um, really was caring about the fact that he is missing his school year. So he wanted his son to be in an English speaking country. And they made it. Um, through our friends, we found a family who are now hosting them and provide um, a beautiful apartment where they feel comfortable. Walter and I were able to visit Nila and Bogdan in Ireland recently, and um, we were very happy for their adjustment. However, it was very clear that Nila turned into a child herself because she doesn't speak English, and uh, every communication is an effort for her. She says, I'm just nodding my head and smiling. Um, she studies English, but it doesn't come easy because all her thoughts are about her second son who enlisted into Ukrainian Defense Army. And um, each morning she just waits for him to give her a note that he is alive. So we are praying for, for them and for all the Ukrainian people who are in such dire situation right now. And we wish that Ukraine prevails and this war ends. Thank you. Peace and Tranquility by Andrei Bondarenko. 
All I want now is to go back to my unsettled, troubled, modest, confusing, peaceful previous life. But now on the 13th day of the war, I realize that disaster, famine, mass deaths, and catastrophe were an integral part of my previous peaceful life. So why do I call it peaceful? From habit, it was never either peaceful nor calm. Well, I was lucky to be born in 1978 during the most peaceful and tranquil period of my country's existence. For my first 12 years, I lived in relative prosperity, peace and tranquility, or it seemed so to me then. I lived quietly, went to kindergarten, then to school, ate bagels, <laughs> drank kefir, <laughs> received chocolates at holidays, signed greeting cards to relatives, studied primers and political pamphlets, and read Charles Dickens and Jules Verne. I was often afraid that the Americans would drop an atomic bomb on us. Sometimes I would wake up in a cold sweat after hearing the sound of a plane at night. But that passed. It was only later when I read my mother's diary after her death that I realized that the peace and tranquility existed only in my childhood mind. For my mother, it was a life full of sorrow, stress and daily survival. But there was someone in our family who, like me, enjoyed peace and tranquility then. That was my grandmother. <laughs> Lived all her life in the village. She survived the Holodomor, the Nazis, the Soviet collective farm slavery. And from 1978 to 1990, she was finally able to grow potatoes in peace. So I, I grew up with a sense of peace and tranquility. I saw it as an inalienable right. I was a child of the 80s, of the 20th century. <laughs> Now I understand how naive this feeling was. A mistake from being born in a short period of peace and tranquility. In the area where I was born, no, no one ever gave anyone the right to peace and quiet. And we, the Ukrainian children of the 1980s, had no privileges or rights. None. Who gave them to us? No one. My mother was born in the remote village of Polisia in the north of Ukraine, where Russian tanks are now breaking into Kiev from Belarus. All her ancestors lived there since ancient times. From time immemorial, a curse hung over our family. No one had a normal home of their own in which to live and earn a living. My great-grandmother, Katerina, spent her life saving money against the despotic will of her abusive husband. She eventually built her own home. But that drunken, abusive husband set it on fire and burned it down. So she packed up all her belongings and her children and went to live with relatives. My grandmother was born in a small cottage along with several dozen other people and when she was 16, the Holodomor began. She and her siblings survived because their mother, Katerina, had a secret can of moonshine. She gave each of her children a spoonful of moonshine every day, and so their bellies did not swell from eating wild grass and bark like the neighbor children. And so they survived. And when she turned 18, my grandma ran away from home and settled near a stone quarry to give herself some freedom. And there she fell in love with a train driver who drove the trains transporting the quarried stones to the east. Moscow was built from this stone. Baba felt a certain peace and tranquility and even love. But then came the war with the Nazis and her train driver was drafted into the army. So Baba went back to the cramped cottage and she married an old soldier who had caught yellow fever in the 1930s while serving in Abkhazia. He was kind and frail and because of his disability, he was not called to the war. 
But uh, when the Nazis came, they herded the women and all the others still in the village into an old wooden church. They then set the church on fire. Miraculously, Baba escaped through a crack in the wall, but the rest of the villagers were burned alive. And after the war, she worked at a flax factory, but it was not enough to keep the house going. So every evening she came home after dark, carrying a bag of defective flax she'd salvaged from the factory. Until midnight, she'd spin the flax on an old wooden spinning wheel and then fall asleep sitting upright. And at five in the morning, the foreman knocked on the window and off she'd go to the factory again. <sighs> well, after 1978, grandma was able to get a little more sleep. The foreman no longer went from house to house. And once a week, she could eat a can of condensed milk or a bar of chocolate. It was a time of peace and quiet. My mother. When she was 16 years old, she left the village and got a job in construction in Kazakhstan. She believed in communism and wanted to be useful to the Soviet people. It was in Kazakhstan she first heard about the Soviet camps. She heard the horrific story of the Kengir uprising, how the prisoners in one of the camps revolted and how they were brutally murdered. People told this story to each other in whispers, looking around, fearful of being heard. My mother stopped believing in communism. She continued to believe only in classical music, poetry, and the human soul. Fate took her to Lviv, where she worked as a metrological engineer, raising and feeding three children entirely herself because she had divorced her husband. He, by the way, continued to live in the same apartment because there was no money to rent another. Almost every day I was awoken by their arguments as they were forced to use the same kitchen. Still, we lived in two rooms, not a single communal one, like some of my friends. So in general, I, I felt peaceful and calm and red dickens on the warm tiles. It's, it's just my nature. I'm an optimist. And my sister is not very much. Uh, later, she went crazy because she believed she had the right to a normal life. <laughs> But she did not, and it was not. And in the end, she could bear no more and went to live in a fictional world. In the 1990s, there was very little money for food and clothing. Since then, I've been in the habit of buying most of my clothes in secondhand shops. Shops like these, which appeared at this time, allowed me to buy the clothes I liked and instead of my brother's old Soviet jacket. I saved bottles to find the money to buy clothes in these seconds. At least vodka was cheap then. We students drank it on an empty stomach, smoking cheap cigarettes, and ever since I've had a stomach ulcer. It was normal in the Faculty of Philosophy where I studied to drink vodka on an empty stomach. But in our new state of Ukraine, for some reason, we all thought we have the right now to privilege, the privilege to peace and tranquility and dignity so we went to political rallies and protests. First, Ukraine without Kuchma, then the first Maidan. All we needed was peace, tranquility, and dignity. We just wanted that right. Then, the second Maidan, hundreds of peaceful protesters shot dead in the streets of Kiev. But it only gave us a week. Peace and tranquility after the victory of the second Maidan lasted literally just a week. And for that one week, I lived in the belief that we were finally worthy of the right to peace and tranquility. And then the Russians landed in Crimea. For eight years, we listened daily to the news of dead Ukrainian soldiers. Sometimes more, sometimes less. But we believed, we believed, I believed that it was all a terrible mistake, that we really do have the right to peace and tranquility and dignity. That in the end, it will all end at last. But after eight years, it did end. The Great War came, burnt, bombed, destroyed houses, the horrific death of thousands of civilians. So far, thousands. Well, on the one hand, it's a curse. 
I know sooner or later my house will burn down, like my great grandmother Katerina's house burned down in the 1910s. It's not burned down yet. But these days I have said goodbye to it dozens of times and goodbye to everything that is dear to me, everything that I will not be able to take with me when Russian tanks come to Lviv. It's like seeing it burn dozens of times. On the other hand, who actually gives anyone any rights? Where does the privilege of having peace and tranquility come from? I do not know. If Ukraine survives, maybe I will have an answer to this question. Right now, I do not know. I stand now in some darkness next to my, my sister and brother, next to friends, next to my deceased mother, grandmother, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-grandmother, next to all Ukrainians who died in this and the other wars and during periods of peace and tranquility. They don't know and I don't know. We just stare at the black darkness in front of us, the light of the house where we were born consumed by flames which do not illuminate the darkness in any way. How can we finally dispel this darkness? Can we? What to write next? I just don't know. Here's my list of books about war. I give it to you. One, The Iliad. Two, The Good Soldier Schweck. Three, War and Peace. Four, all Quiet on the Western Front. Five, The Song of Roland. Six, The Little Prince. Seven, The Unwomanly Face of War and Oral History of Women in World War II. Eight, Gone with the Wind. Nine, The Lord of the Rings. Ten, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Eleven, The Slaughterhouse Five. Twelve, Henry the Sixth. Thirteen, The Quiet American. 14, Dr. Zhivago. 15, The Empire of the Sun. 16, Gravity's Rainbow. 17, The Three Musketeers. 18, Parade's End. 19, From Here to Eternity. 20, The Kite Runner. 21, Austerlitz. 22, Catch 22. 23, I Hear the Caged Birds Sing. 24, A Farewell to Arms. 25, The Thin Red Line. The list will soon be significantly expanded. I'm already somehow on my own. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Now I have children of my own. They ask their mother, what will I be? Will I be handsome? Will I be rich? I tell them tenderly. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Que sera, sera. Well, I want to say thank you so much uh, to these actresses uh, who for sharing these pieces, these voices of uh, women and all Ukrainian uh, stories, experiences, and, and for really sharing the spirit, connecting with the spirit of these pieces. Um, uh, this has been a really extremely moving uh, collection of pieces. And I want to thank the uh, Irena and Tatiana for their testimony that they have shared. Um, we have some more uh, reflections 
that uh, some guests will be sharing with you. Um, but uh, let's give a round of applause to our actors for these this fine work. And Lorraine, 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 you did a beautiful job directing these wonderful actresses. And I, we're gonna hear again from Tatiana and Irena with their reflections before we open it up to everyone else for their uh, responses. It was tremendously moving. Walter Ruby, in addition to being married to Tatiana Rappaport, who I'm glad we did finally get to see on video, you're a veteran journalist and you've been writing about and lecturing on your many visits to Ukraine. In addition, Walter is president of Jamaat, Jews and Muslims and Allies Acting Together, a grassroots interfaith group here in the greater Washington DC area. Walter Ruby is the co-author with Muslim American writer who's here tonight, Sabiha Rehman, of the book, We Refuse to Be Enemies, How Muslims and Jews Can Make Peace, One Friendship at a Time, published in 2021 by Arcade Publishers. Walters, Walter, why don't you share a few reflections with us? Thank you, thank you so much, Ari. Thank you so much, Lorraine. Well, we just heard three powerful, deeply moving plays suffused with the horror, death, destruction, randomness, and absurdity of war, written by three talented Ukrainian playwrights who are scared shitless as to the very possible imminent extinction of themselves, their loved ones, and their peoples. They are distraught that their lives have been massively disrupted and much, and much of what they have built personally and collectively over 30 years has been senselessly destroyed. Yet what they are not is they are not beaten down or cowed into submission or hopelessness. They are part of a Ukrainian people that over the past 30 years has collect collectively pulled themselves out of being Savuk, Soviet man, broken and corrupted, and turned themselves into a people intent on achieving dignity and self-determination and a decent national life. Ukrainians today deeply value their own lives as a free people, as free people, enough to put those lives on the line to defend that freedom. And that is the secret of their tenacious and successful resistance to Putin's evil campaign to resubjugate them. Now, I've witnessed that transformation over in more than 15 visits to the country over the past 33 years. My first visit was in November 1989, when I came to Kiev as a reporter for the Jerusalem Post, and I witnessed a fascinating but fraught dialogue between um, local Jewish activists and leaders of the Ukrainian national movement called Ruch over, over the subject of Bogdan Khmelnytsky, the 17th century Ukrainian Cossack hero, widely seen as Ukraine's greatest national hero, who liberated much of Ukraine from centuries of Polish rule, but at the same time unleashed horrific pogroms against the Jews of Ukraine. At the time, it felt to me that this clash of historic narrative, seeing the two sides give these very different diametrically opposed pictures of Chemonitsky and who he was, and, and not only Chemonitsky, but su subsequent Ukrainian nationalist leaders, um, were they heroes or villains, all of that showed a basic incompatibility between Jews and Ukrainians, which I thought would cause all but a few Jews to leave Ukraine in the years ahead. But yet, um, as the um, years went by after independence in 1991, it became clear that a sizable majority of the Jews of Ukraine, I think about 200,000 uh, out of uh, half a million who were there in 89, 200,000 stayed and they chose to stay. Um, Anti-Semitism, which had been so pervasive in the Soviet period, declined radically. Long before the election of a Jewish president in 2019, um, being Jewish in Ukraine had become to feel safe, even cool. And this was, I think, part and part parcel of a, the emergence of a pluralistic Ukraine, a place where Russian and Ukrainian speakers, Orthodox 
uh, Orthodox Christians and Catholic Christians, Jews and Tatar Muslims, all could coexist and interact fruitfully and together and together oppose Putin's brazen attempt to force them back into Ruski Mir, Russian world. Well, as to Putin's charges of Ukrainian Nazism as the causes belly for his invasion, um, let's not forget that in, two, in the 2019 election, when a Jew was overwhelmingly elected president of Ukraine, the neo-nationalist party, Svoboda, received less than 3% of the vote. And let's compare that minimal, minimal, minuscule showing with France, where, for example, just a week or so ago, Marine Le Pen received 41%, even, even in defeat. Or Italy, which elected a neo, you know, demagogic uh, nationalist like Berlusconi. And of course, our own United States, where Trump was elected in, 19, in 2016. Last week, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov of Russia said that the existence of a Jewish president in Ukraine didn't disprove Ukraine's supposed Nazism, because after all, Hitler himself was part Jewish, and Jews themselves are, can be the worst anti-Semites. And af after these obscene calumnies were uttered, and then doubled down on by the, by the foreign minister of Russia, many Jews and, and Israelis are finally appear to be waking up as to where the real as to where the real anti-Semitism and neo-Nazism are coming from. It's not from Ukraine. Ukraine, with all its ambiguities and challenges, is an inspiring and incredibly inspiring example of human empowerment. So let Americans learn from and emulate the example of Ukraine in standing up and fighting to protect our democracy and defeating the neo-fascism and authoritarianism that directly threaten all of us today. So Slava Ukraina, glory to Ukraine. Thank you. Um, I'm really glad, really glad you were able to add that perspective, Walter. I want to bring back Irena Chalupa as we invite uh, Henry at the Arts Club to open up the uh, videos for everyone uh, so that we can have a, a community conversation about what we've heard tonight, both in the plays and from these powerful testimonies. Irena, you, you got us started with some powerful words. Uh, how did you take in these plays? I thought the plays were extremely moving, very, very strong, and um, they captured what I have heard from, um, from my friends and family, what life is like um, underneath flying bullets and missiles. And, uh, and just, I live in a relatively busy part of Washington here in Tenleytown on Van Ness Street. There's a police station close by, so I'm used to police sirens. But if you can imagine just blaring sirens every few hours, and it's an alarm, you have to drop what you're doing and go into a shelter because you never know when an actual missile will come flying by. You never know whether the Ukrainians will be able to take it out or um, or whether it's going to come for you. So it's uh, a friend of mine uh, in Lviv, which has not seen the kind of terror that other cities in Ukraine has, but is, is shelled on a pretty regular basis because there's a military base uh, nearby, uh, told me how important it is that people call her and make sure that she's okay. She was profoundly hurt that some of her closest friends in Germany and other places hadn't thought about her. And you know, people's people's psychology is very frayed at this moment. People are um, very vulnerable. But at the same time, you know, I have to tell you that this war has produced phenomenal outpouring of talent and just horrible, I mean, not horrible, fabulous existential humor song and, and just um, one, of, one of these old Ukrainian um, uh, patriotic songs, because, you know, this is not the first time that Ukrainians are attacked by Russia. This, this is something that has been going on for, for over 300 years. Um, that one of these songs goes um, that Ukrainians are fighting, fighting, they're not giving in, they're going to a battle and they're laughing as they're going. And I've seen that in so many videos um, all, over, um, uh, all over the web. So um, 
Ukrainians are very open people. And I want to follow up on something that Walter said. Um, I worked in Ukraine for five years from 94 to, um, uh, to almost two, um, uh, 2000. And um, Kiev, I remember when the main synagogue of Kiev was given over to the Jewish community. It had been a marionette theater. Um, it's the, the Brodsky synagogue smack dab in the middle of, of the center. And it, it's, it is, it is a very, very diverse country. Ukraine, when the Soviet Union fell, fell apart, Ukraine was the first country to decriminalize homosexuality. I think people forget what a close society the Soviet Union was and how eagerly Ukrainians have embraced just modernity. And I think that's a stark thing that we're seeing today, that Ukraine wants to be a cool, modern country. It wants to live like a cool, modern country that is accepting, that is diverse, that is open, that is trying new things. Russia doesn't want that kind of a future for itself. And it is willing to kill everybody to deprive that kind of a future for Ukraine. And yet we're left with those haunting words of our last play, if Ukraine survives. I think Ukraine will survive. I, I've come up with this new kind of slogan or, or, or um, a kind of a credo. Um, as far as I'm, I believe in a Ukrainian victory, it's going to come at an extremely high price. Though all Ukrainians all over the world will have to pay, but it will come. I mentioned earlier that the Russians have been trying to wipe Ukrainians out off of the face of the earth for th over 300 years, yet here we, here we are, we're, st we're still here. And keep, you know, we keep putting up the good fight and we're getting better at it. And um, if only the West had given Ukraine what they needed yesterday rather than today, the war might look, might look differently. However, I would like to say that this new idea that I've come up with is um, where there is where there are Ukrainians, there is Ukraine. So I think we have to, in this situation, we have to be like the Jews were before the state of Israel was created. And if, God forbid, Ukraine suffers some, a defeat, um, that means that the world will have been defeated. The civilized world will have been defeated. That means all of us are in peril. That means democracy is in peril. That means freedom is in peril. That means sessions like what, what we're having right now are in peril. Everything is up for gra grabs. You know, the bad guys are getting stronger and there are a lot of them. And uh, so we have to think that each one of us each Ukrainian, each American who believes in, in freedom and democracy and openness and the freedom of the human spirit, we are each an island, but islands joined together become continents and continents become planets. So we cannot even countenance a defeat. Victory is all that we're going to accept. Beautiful. Uh, before we go out, to uh, the Zoom room and we'll ask people to maybe raise their hands in the chat or the participation participants room and Lorraine, uh, you and I can call uh, on folks. Let's have the opportunity to hear from any of our actors who'd like to um, reflect on their experience tonight. Uh, and maybe we can also have Tatiana if you wanna to respond to the plays. Maybe we'll start with you, Tatiana, then the actors, and then Lorraine, you can call on our first friends. Thank you, I, it was deeply moving for me to um, hear the plays, uh, extremely moving. I thought that every point that I was thinking about uh, when, um, you know, trying to understand what's going on these days was touched on. So I'm really amazed how um, this, um, the art could really render the feelings and um, just to touch so deeply hearts and souls. Uh, that's what definitely I experienced. Um, I think, um, of myself a little bit because 
I was born in the Soviet Union, in the former Soviet Union, as we are saying now, uh, and Ukraine was just part of it, just part of that huge country. So when I grew up, um, we spoke Russian, we studied Ukrainian at school. Um, my grandmother was throwing a couple of words here and there. So that was my exposure to Ukrainian um, part, right? Um, then I uh, immigrated to America in 1989. And uh, my first visit back was 15 years later because at the time when I immigrated, we did not know whether we will be ever able to come back and see our families. We were leaving Soviet Union with uh, basically very little. So when I came to Ukraine 15 years after, um, I saw a very different country that I left. Um, obviously in 89, it was already Ruch movement, it was already uh, people gathering to um, think seriously about the opportunities for Ukraine after the demise of the upcoming demise. But uh, it was still um, very little of that. So when I came back, I saw a new country. I saw new people. They were kind of feeling, looking differently. Um, there was freedom in the air. But it was so disorienting for me because um, I still thought I would um, see something that I left, which interestingly enough was also very dear to me, but I saw this new country. And with um, the ensuing visits to my family, I, um, I learned to love and to appreciate the spirit of people who were building this new country. It was really inspiring, especially in 2014 when we visit Ukraine and uh, went to Maidan. And uh, it was terrible what we've seen. It was um, tense all over. Um, it was destruction. But we talked to people and um, it was this amazing spirit which prevailed. So, I'm thinking that it will happen again. I, I want to believe it. I am completely with Irena and um, I share the existential part of the place. I also feel a little bit lost because I think about my identity. I think about the uh, painful history of Ukraine, but um, I think that the good should prevail and um, I want to deliver in it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to ask for people to uh, respond in uh, 60 seconds or less so that we can include as many folks as possible. Uh, any of our actors want to volunteer to kick us off? Well, I just, from my perspective, it's you know, you read about the news and you're like, what can I do? <laughs> it's so it's just so lovely to be a part of something that feels like it's helping, um, you know, in some small part. So I'm, I'm very honored to take part in this. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say I'm deeply touched, first of all, to be part of the project and read those powerful place together with my colleague actresses and work with Lorraine and Ari and hear those testimonies because I live between two continents. I just came back from Poland where I first had actually seen the refugees running away from the war, the mothers with their children. I housed myself uh, a Ukrainian people and um, also stood up from Kiev. Uh, my family is also partially from Lviv and Rohovich, so it's a very complex history, but humanity prevails. And I deeply believe seeing what I've seen firsthand in Poland, talking to Ukrainians, 
communicating with them with broken Russian and Ukrainian because they are people from Kharkiv. I've been in Kharkiv, I've been in Lviv, in Kiev, in many, many places in Ukraine. And it breaks my heart to see those cities being destroyed and people killed. I feel truly honored, thank you, for including me in this part. I did not expect when I come back to US that the first thing I'll be able to join you. Thank you. Thank you for making it possible for, by extending your trip to be part of this. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm happy to be able to read this mother's story. Mm. It's a reminder that it is every mother's story. Every mm. mother whose uh, children are threatened by things beyond their control. And I think uh, doing a theatrical piece about it reminds us that every mother is the same mother worrying about her children. Did they eat? Are they all right? I need to hear from them. And uh, to me, that's the most important thing about it, that every mother is the same mother. The Africans who were not allowed onto trains and buses, their mothers worried about them too. The, mm. uh, uh, the, the discrimination that they faced during this, their mothers cried for them too. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we want to open it up to uh, more uh, community comments, reflections. And again, uh, you know, if you could limit your comment to uh, one minute or less uh, so we can hear from as many individuals as possible. I'd like to share my thoughts. Yes, go ahead. I, uh, listening to all the uh, actors and the testimonials reminds, it brings it very close to home. It reminds me of a period when I was growing up in Pakistan and war had broken out with India. And it was the poetry and the songs that stirred our souls, that gave us comfort, that inspired us, and that lifted our morale and enabled us to feel the power of bravery stand up against aggression. And listening to the actress today uh, just reminded me of, brought that feeling back of the power of art that can not only move us, but also strengthen us. So I, I just appreciated that very deeply. And thank you to all of you and to the actors and to the test, those who gave testimony for putting their heart and soul into it. Thank you, Sabiha. Is there another comment? Ira Weiss is always good for a comment, I'm sure. Um, but I'm sure there are many folks who have something to share. Phil Arnaud is here from the Center for International Theater Development that Blair Rubel talked about. So it's an honor to have Phil here with us too. Again, if anybody wants to just hit the raise hand button, we have, and let's see. I am viewing someone's shared screen. Yes, Henry will take care of that, I hope. To. Yes, I am about to. Thank you. Beautiful. Ira, did you want to share? 
I, I just, there were presentations were phenomenal. Um, I was just, I was so preoccupied during all the presentations by a conversation I had earlier today with a, several people from several countries who um, viewed the Ukraine problem as an American aggression. I, I, I'm so taken aback by how many people believe that. Um, and these are people largely from the left, not the right. And that's what threw me. I, that, that's what occupied, I couldn't help thinking about that as I'm listening to these Ukrainians speaking about the horrors that are happening. And I, I, I just, beyond me, how half the people, well, not half, but a lot of people I know are convinced that this is all the doings of America, NATO, and, uh, and, and the West. Thank you for bringing that into the conversation. I'm actually, I'm way really sorry I brought it into the conversation, but anyway. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah. Phil Arnaud, are you with us? Perhaps. Phil is on mute. Okay. He's really responsible for the, as Blair Rubel said in his wonderful introduction, uh, the Center for International Theater Development commissioned 23 different playwrights in Ukraine, paying $1,000 each to get money in their accounts. And they all have responded. So can, we, a, can we talk? Please, we'd love to hear you. Who are you? My name's Barry. And my name is Hershka. Uh -oh. I'm Polish. And did you lose my screen again? Yes, we did. Okay, I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I want to just say, a, I'm going to read a poem real quick. I wrote it. It's called Ukrainians the Brave. Oh, beautiful for heroes prove through liberating strife who more than self, their country love, and freedom more than life. Ukrainians, Ukrainians, may peaceful life you see. You fight the fight, your cause is right, and God pray justice be. Uh, that was kind of from um, Catherine Lee Bakes. This is a rather long, it, it, it take me, it's kind of a six more verses. You want me to go on? We got two more verses from you, sure. O okay, okay. The hope you give unto the world, may we provide your needs as you stand strong and unified <clears throat> against the tyrant's deeds. Ukrainians, Ukrainians, may peaceful life you see as you stay strong through battle long and God pray justice be. Your bravery inspires the world as seldom seen before. You stand for right and freedom, the devil's at your door. Ukrainians, Ukrainians, may peaceful life you see You've paid your price with sacrifice and God pray justice be. Beautiful. I wanna thank Roe Harris for putting in the chat once again, the names and the uh, URLs for the charitable foundations that are helping to support the re war relief effort. Thank you, Roe. Any other comments? Blair, how about you? Well, this has been a very obviously powerful uh, evening. And I, I wanna go back to uh, one of the observations that was made about the power of the arts. And I think, um, you know, as we, looked over the development of Ukraine over the past 30, 40 years, uh, for very obvious reasons, we focused on the political. But uh, the arts are now demonstrating what a, a really profound role. And it's not just theater, it's dance, it's music. We, we could have had an evening of Ukrainian uh, rock music uh, the arts have been 
very, very profoundly powerful in shaping uh, what Ukraine is becoming. And we ignore the power of the arts at our peril. Uh, one of the reasons why um, I think we, a lot, far too many people were surprised when the Russians actually invaded and that the Ukrainians stood up and fought is that we were distracted by uh, what turns out to have been rather important, visible, but in the end, superficial political infighting in Ukraine. And we missed what was happening underneath um, that umbrella of political discord. And um, I, I think what we're learning now is that we should turn to uh, the playwrights and the muses in all different forms to have a better understanding of how Ukraine and other societies develop. So thank you for sharing this, everybody. Absolutely. Well, we have time for one more comment and I see Phil Arnaud is um, close. There he is, brother. And uh, if you unmute yourself, the floor is yours and then Lorraine will take it back. This was wonderful, thank you all. Um, when I talk about what we're doing, uh, it was proved in spades tonight because what we are doing together and what we're doing with these playwrights is making the first draft of history seen through the lens of the artist. And that's going to end up historically being valuable. I think it's incredibly valuable right now, because as my partner John Friedman says, we're also helping the Ukraine envision the future of their country with these reflections on what things are now. So I could not be more proud of being a part of what you've done tonight. And I thank you very, very much. And bravo to your actors. Yeah. Thank you for making it possible. Well, I, I will. Uh, I'm sorry. I just. If it's okay, I just wanted to say one very quick thing, which was that um, we have someone on, on this, um, among the, the viewers, a, a, friend, a dear friend named Yana Abramovna, who is living in Brooklyn and just has been working day and night, night and day. She's been in touch with Kiev nonstop for, you know, from the very beginning and, and arranging acts of kindness, which is helping getting a car from this part of Kiev to another to drive somebody to a hospital, I mean, and there's different causes, but I mean, she's an example of someone, I mean, uh, there's not too many, but there are others that they're just out there in the trenches every day that nobody knows what they're doing, but it, it, she's had a huge effect. So thank you, Janschka. Terrific. Thank you, uh, well, I want to say thank you to everyone, to our wonderful actors. Once again, great applause to you. Um, I want to say thank you to our stage manager uh, and also all of the members of the Arts Club, Dorit and Jan and Henry, um, for their uh, support, uh, both in front and behind the scenes uh, to make this event possible. Um, I am so moved and, and so... Um, uh, just uh, happy that we were able to share these pieces, uh, these voices, and connect with the spirit of these stories. Um, you know, uh, Philip, you said some wonderful things there about, you know, uh, the power, and, and this was already echoed, you know, earlier in the evening, but just the power of um, being able to see through the lens of the artist. And, and I think we're all experiencing right in the moment together, um, the power of art and its ability to create community and connection 
And that is certainly what we need more of uh, as we go forward. And so I thank you all so much for uh, coming together in this way with us, with Voices Festival Productions and with these artists and uh, with uh, all of our uh, uh, participants providing testimony uh, and uh, information this evening. Um, I, I can't think of a better way uh, for us to move forward and uh, and and support those that are in need, such as our um, citizens in Ukraine. So, uh, as Lisa said, uh, it it feels good um, to this, this degree to be able to um, actively do something, uh, even small, uh, to support um, you know what's happening right now. So thank you all so much for for creating this this sense of community with us. Kick it back to Dorit Carroll. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I am grateful to have been a witness to the art created tonight. Thank you, Ari, Lorraine, and the cast and the crew for the experience you gave us all. Good night.